Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India everyone welcome to images imaginations and cultures this is a set of 10 lectures that we shall cover in the next few days um, before I start with the lecture series um, I do want to clarify here that this uh, set of lectures uh, would be heavily interdisciplinary in nature that is um, I'm going to draw from multiple disciplinary orientations to talk about images imaginations and cultures um, but even if it's an interdisciplinary uh, sort of lecture series, I would still um, emphasize on the sociological aspects a little more than the others, um, just to look at uh, these contexts, the processes um, in a more sociological um, understanding. So this is a series um, of lectures that we will cover starting with uh, the first one which is going to be the introduction to the lecture series. Um, in the second lecture, we will look at the history of visual cultures, um, looking at you know, what is visual culture, what has been the historical processes that have guided the growth, the birth of visual cultures, and um, how do we make meaning of visual cultures, particularly in the context of images, their imaginations in various cultural contexts. The third uh, lecture will concentrate on visual cultures and critical theory particularly. So we will be looking at uh, four uh, theorists who have, uh, who have talked about visual cultures, who have talked about images, their roles um, and processes guiding in society. The fourth lecture would be looking at photographs as performative space. So. In the fourth lecture, we will look at not just the context of photographs, um, but we will also look at the context of space and particularly social space and how space becomes performative, space becomes an aspect of performance, um, particularly through images uh, such as uh, photographs. The fifth lecture would be looking at imaging and imagining the other, and I quote unquote other here, um, to look at some of the uh, some of the othering processes, some of the boundary work that has uh, been going on with uh, regard to producing images, with regard to studying images. So we will look at uh, imaging and Im imagining the other. In the sixth lecture, we will look at postcards, particularly looking at the history of postcards and, um, and some of the sociological dimensions of um, postcards um, as they speak to the idea of images and their imaginations. In the seventh lecture, we will look at images in the terms of their truth, memory and embodiment. So we'll look particularly at um, what does it mean to have an embodiment in terms of um, images. Um, in the eighth lecture, we will look at questions of images and mobilities and particularly here, um, when we talk about mobilities, we are not just talking about physical mobility, we are not just talking about mobilities in the sense of migration, but we are also looking at mobilities in the form of social mobilities. So uh, in the eighth lecture, we will look at how images and mobilities come together to give us new perspectives on um, images and imaginations. In the ninth lecture, we will look at images and intersectionality. So inter intersectionalities is, um, if you are familiar with the uh, framework, is an exceptionally important uh, framework uh, coming from uh, gender feminist studies. Um, and it looks at how one's identity is negotiated in the intersections of um, the various, attrib various attributes such as um, you know, race, ethnicity, caste, class, gender, um, etc. So, in the ninth lecture, uh, we are going to look at how images um, are studied, how images are contextualized 
in the context of intersectionalities. And in the final lecture, the concluding lecture of these series, we would be looking at um, how you know the the newer processes in terms of images and imaginings for example the digital turn um, in in various disciplines um, have brought in new perspectives of understanding images of studying images across disciplinary boundaries um, and what is the future road ahead with regard to images and imaginations in various cultures so this is in a nutshell um, the uh, layout of the 10 lectures that we would be covering in the next um, um, few days in the series. So before I go into any of the um, sociological understanding, let me start with a very simple question and I ask you in your mind, what do you think is an image? So I want you to you know, step back and uh, take a minute or two to understand, to revise, to get an understanding for yourself, how do you understand an image? So I have, um, I have some popular understanding of image here uh, for you and it may relate to what you identify to be an image or you may be imagining an image as something very different also. So the first idea that an image brings to our mind is the idea of a visual representation. That whenever we see something that is visually represented, we imagine it to be an image. And it can be in the form of a photograph, it can be in the form of a screenshot, talking of the digital age. Um, but whenever we see a visual representation, it uh, forms an example of an image to us. The second type of, of frame of picture, a frame of um, you know, the shot in the mind, and that you know, stays with us as a mental picture or impression, and that is um, you know, all, all, also an example of an image. An idea, so an idea that we may have can be the idea in the form of an image. A popular conception um, often uh, uh, professed through mass media avenues um, can be an example of an image and a reproduction or imitation or of something or someone can be uh, an example of an image also. So given this broad scope of what can constitute um, uh, of an image, what we will be looking at in this uh, lecture series particularly is the visual representation of what an image is. Um, and we will also explore questions of how an image um, is an idea uh, and, and you know how it then gets translated into society and social processes um, to give us uh, the image that we are looking at or exploring. Um, we will be talking about the other four examples of images also, but um, mostly we will be concentrating on visual representation as well as um, image as an idea. So on the starting point, um, I would like to introduce uh, to you the idea of visual images, that visual images constitute how science is to be constructed, organized, legitimated and distinguished from non-science. So in this journey of looking at images, um, imaginations and cultures, um, we are also asking a critical question of the production of scientific knowledge. So when we study, for example, when we study images sociologically, there has to be a purpose of that study, there has to be a goal of that study. And um, a, a fundamental goal of uh, this study, of course, is to aim at um, production of scientific knowledge. And um, Hempel's quote that I give you here is a wonderful way to start um, with that inquiry. So in a basic sense, as we see, an image means a picture whether the referent is present as an object or in the mind. At the same time, a picture in the sense of a sign that resembles a picture is of something cannot really be in the mind as a moment's reflection will show. 
So, what this part of the quote also brings in is the idea that um, n not just the image becomes um, you know an object, but whether the referent is present as an object. So, you know, an image is an image constitutes something, and towards that there is a referent also that is constituting that image. So the, the questions of the object, the subject, subjectivities, all of this would come to the fore. All of these would come to um, the questioning of um, how do we understand image and how do we imagine uh, an image. So um, as I was saying that the goal, the purpose of critically looking at uh, of images, um, the, the goal is the scientific production of knowledge. So when we look at, and this is just a, a fundamental knowledge for you um, to steer uh, through the next uh, lectures, um, is that when we look, when we talk of science, when we talk of you know any form of science or scientific knowledge, we we refer to a body of knowledge that is systematically arranged. Right? So, you know, in this body of knowledge, knowledge is the purpose and systems, the way how we accomplish towards that, um, that purpose is the methods, how we accomplish that goal. And if you are familiar with the history of disciplinary evolutions, um, you will see that uh, the, the growth and the birth and growth of various sciences, for example, physical sciences, um, on social sciences have been on, on very you know distinct trajectories with regard to the scientific quest for um, knowledge production. And over time what we have seen that we have gone through in terms of these various forms of sciences, we have gone through eras of um, divergence and we have also, we are going through an era of convergence also. So with, this is important to keep in mind because image as a concept is studied um, you know, across disciplines. So an anthropologist would um, study an image very differently than a computer scientist would do. A sociologist would study an image a little differently than how an anthropologist would do. Um, a, a physical practitioner, a medical practitioner would study a medical image um, according to the needs of their profession. So images are dealt with across disciplines, but how you study an image, what are the perspectives that you're bringing to that studying of that image um, is going to decide for the type of knowledge that is going to be produced as part of that study. And of course, the method, the vehicle, uh, you know, which is going to take you to that knowledge production. So as I said at the starting of um, my lecture today, that we are going to look at uh, you know, images from a sociological perspective. And in that regard, um, just to introduce uh, you, if you're not familiar with that, um, you know, society forms an integral component in this context. And, you know, all human beings are social. And so it is, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, a little difficult to predict social behavior. And, um, you know, the reason that I'm stating all of this um, in the very introductory part is that when we go through um, critical questions of othering, for example, or critical questions of intersectionalities, for example, um, you know, you can place the context within the very social process within the very social context and then you can make meaning of um, the image that you are uh, going to study. So what we will do is um, we will talk about some of the um, theoretical frameworks that will help us achieve this goal and in doing so um, you would you would be gathering a skill set um, that will help you to examine what is um, you know, given an image, but um, uh, we're not here to really talk about what it should be or what it ought to be. So given the sociological lens, we are going to look at the scientific study of images through the sociological um, toolkit, through theories, frameworks, critical questions of sociology, and we, we're going to examine, um, you know, what is not, not 
rather not what it should be or not what it ought to be. So, what does it mean when um, when I say that uh, you know you need to get your sociological toolkit to critically understand what an image is? So, here on the screen you can see some of the major theoretical assumptions guiding society and uh, culture, and we are going to look at uh, many if not most of these um, theoretical assumptions. For example, we will be looking at critical theory um, where it starts with the theoretical assumption that society has forms of alienated consciousness uh, reproduced by the institutions of mass society. We would be looking at ethnomethodology, which is uh, in between anthropology, uh, sociological, social research methods. Um, and it's, it is based on the theoretical assumption that society as the fragile order displayed by the common sense methods used by members in practical reasoning. So, these are carefully thought uh, methods that have evolved in social sciences, particularly in anthropology and sociology. Um, feminism, for example, starts with an assumption that society is as the bounded system of social relations with which interests of men dominate those of women. And of course, you know, the, the road of feminism actually questions this um, back and proposes uh, new forms of critical framework. Functionalism is one of the classic, classic uh, sociological uh, tenets where uh, the assumption of society as the social system in which its various parts are functionally integrated with each other. Um, interactionism, Marxism, structuralism, uh, systems theory, Weberianism, all these are very classic um, tenets of sociological inquiry. And I encourage you, if you are not familiar with these um, areas of uh, inquiry, um, you can always pick up, uh, you know, a classic sociological textbook and, um, you know, revise these uh, ideas because they, uh, as I said, you know, uh, you know, most of these, um, you know, theoretical foundations, most of these theoretical assumptions would actually be informing um, many of the questions that we would be asking in terms of image uh, imaginations and the society. So, when we talk of sociological perspectives, the components of, uh, given the course, the title of the, of the course, Images, Imaginations and Cultures, um, I would like to emphasize that we are asking these questions, we are, we are actually positioning these contexts in societal context. So, as I said, sociology is the scientific study of human behavior in society. And um, most of these contexts, uh, you know, the questions of images, the questions of imaginations and cultures are embedded in the larger power dynamics of social institutions, social patterns and social stratifications. So, the questions that we are asking, we are going to ask about images or their imaginations is not outside of the society. They are embedded within these larger structures, deeper structures of social institutions, patterns and stratifications and therefore, it becomes all the more necessary, it becomes imperative for us to actually understand what are these social processes, what are these social institutions, what are the social networks within which, um, you know, we are studying images, we are studying how they have been imagined and what have been the cultural contexts. So, this is important for you to keep in mind um, as we proceed through the, um, the lecture series. Another classic point here, um, which uh, again I, I, I would like to introduce to you if you are not familiar with, is the idea of sociological imagination. So, sociological imagination is a classic um, concept coming from C. W. Mills uh, idea of the sociological uh, imagination, where Mills um, talks about three facets, three aspects um, that sociological imagination refers to. 
The first is understanding historical contexts. So, locate history, um, as uh, Mills, Mills would say, locating the society in human history, features of that historical period, social change, macrostructural changes causing social problems and changes. All of these go behind the scene to inform um, the evolution of social processes and the same holds true for when we see or study images um, sociologically that the historical factors, the historical contexts become uh, one of the most uh, necessary contexts to understand behind uh, production of that image. The second idea that um, uh, Mill's uh, sociological imagination puts forward is the idea of structure, is that the structure of the society, essential components, how does one society differ from the other. So how does, and, and of course, how does an individual or a group of people um, situate themselves in a given context um, of a social structure, thus you know, that becoming their social location. So, social location is, is deeply uh, entwined with historical context, with social structure, and uh, the third context that Mills uh, would call biography, or, um, or the varieties or categories of people um, prevailing in society. And uh, so, biography of a society, for example, gives us a sense of how, um, categories, for example, evolve, social categories, for example, evolve in society. Um, for example, um, if you are familiar with the term, uh, with the con context of gender, uh, you know, in gender studies, we see that uh, what started from, um, you know, uh, a binary, which is male and female, which is, which was a biological sex, uh, you know, statistical variable that, uh, you know, male or female, that evolved into a sophisticated understanding of what it means to be, uh, you know, have a gender. And gender, um, by all means, is is a fluid concept. You know, it, it it is changing. It changes not just for society, but also for an individual. So at various scales, gender changes. So so biography looks at these um, evolutions of categories that we see in society, and how is human behavior changing? Because the changing of human behavior would um, inform the changing of these categories, and in turn, how is human nature shaped by society's dominant institutions? So, when I say society's dominant institutions, um, social institutions such as um, family, such as marriage, such as um, education, such as religion, etc., um, would inform how uh, you know the practices of society uh, evolve and. Of course, that changing practices, that evolving uh, nature of practices um, would be reflected in the type of images that we study in society. So what C. W. Mills talks about is that neither the life of an individual nor the history of a society can be understood without understanding both. And, you know, C. W. Mills rightly points here that, um, you know, the individual and the society is, you know, important for each other um, to, to an, an extent. And um, it is practically impossible to understand one without understanding the other. Because as I said, um, individuals, groups of people are all embedded within the larger, deeper networks of society and therefore to understand one, we definitely need to understand the other. So sociological imagination, um, if we have to define in, in a sentence, is the ability to see the relationship between individual experiences and the larger society. So this is what sociological imagination boils down to, that as researchers, we need to be able to see the relationship between individual experiences and the larger society. So 
Here, I'm not only talking about the individual or the social structures, but I'm also talking about scale. I'm also talking about understanding images at their various scales that, you know, you can look at images at the individual scale. Um, you can look at images at a local, regional scale. You can look at images at an international scale also. So um, this is one of the uh, very important tool kit, uh, sociological imagination, that you need to keep in mind uh, when we look at, when we study any image, when we study any um, sort of imagining of an image in a given cultural, cultural context. So when I say cultural context, and I've been saying cultural context quite a few times now here um, in this lecture, um, what do we need to know about culture that will be helpful for us to understand um, you know, various forms of images, imaginations, um, etc. So um, one thing that we must keep in mind, and uh, you know, this is and this is the second layer of um, toolkit that I'm providing here is that when we look at any culture, when we look at any cultural context, we see that, um, you know, much of the human history of cultural evolution that we, um, you know, think of, that we have studied, that we view, has been driven by questions of power and agency. So what is, um, what is the question around agency and power that we are talking of? So agency is actions that individuals take both alone and in groups in forming and transforming cultural identities. So here, as you see, I was talking of the question of scale that um, it is the action that individuals would do, the actions that individuals would take. Um, not just by themselves, but also in groups, as social groups, informing and transforming cultural identities. So another given in this is that cultural identities also evolve. So the fluidity of cultural practices, the fluidity of cultural practices and uh, identities, um, you know, is something that we need to keep in mind when we look at any particular image. And of course, um, questions of agency, questions of you know how one acts or how one is able to act given a certain circumstances, um, you know, relates to questions of power, relates to question of um, status, relates to questions of wealth in society. The second um, idea that we need to keep in mind in the context of uh, time and uh, in the context of culture is that time and space. So we, we if, if you are not familiar with the context of time and space, I will deal with space um, more broadly in my um, fourth lecture. Uh, but uh, just, just to introduce you here is that time and space are interlinked that, you know, we cannot understand one without understanding the other and that we are not just talking about chronological or historical time here we are also talking about the politics of time what we do with time um, in terms of power and agency is also um, going to be front and center in this discussion so time and space um, are you know crucially important also in questions of culture so now I will introduce you to two conceptual frameworks that are coming out um, primarily from anthropo cultural anthropological studies and sociological studies. Um, and the first frame, and, and both these frameworks would be uh, helpful for us to go and understand, um, you know, images, um, you know, in whatever context we would un try to understand them. The first uh, conceptual framework that um, I, I would like to introduce you 
to um, is is called gender geographies of power or in short it's called ggp and this was proposed by uh, sarah Mahler and patricia pesar anthropologists um, in 2001 and uh, you know later on they also talked so they built on this um, framework uh, more but more but um, what is central to this idea what is important to this idea is that ggp as a framework was formed with respect to looking at a migration dynamic. So, um, Mahler and Pissar looked at uh, migration dynamics to propose uh, gender geographies of power, but what has happened over the decades is that um, GTP has been used by many scholars across the globe to understand a variety of contexts beyond migration. And um, there are these, the, the building blocks of GTP as I will uh, show you now is that uh, you know, they contribute in their own ways to understanding images as we are trying to understand here. So, just to give you a very brief definition of what GGP is. So, GGP is a framework for analyzing people's gendered social agency. So, power and agency, something that we just talked about, corporal and cognitive. So, it's not just physical um, sort of agency we are talking about, we are also talking about cognitive you know, how we comprehend. Given their own initiative as well as their positioning within multiple hierarchies of power, operative within and across many terrains. Um, the gender geographies of power framework is intended to aid case and comparative study research and analysis of gender and its articulation with other socially constructed identities across transnational spaces. So, GGP here um, brings to the fore many of the components that we have already um, discussed. So, it's talking about social agency, it's talking about the cognitive and it's also talking about spaces, right? So, we are talking about uh, the idea of building, idea of studying gender geographies across, uh, you know, spaces, across a variety of spaces and um, you know how people enact, how people negotiate uh, their social agency um, in those spaces. So, GGP has um, four building blocks. The first is geographic scales. Um, geographic scales is um, you know again something that I uh, was referring to in my previous slide that you know you are talking about the individual, the local, regional, um, sort of interna national, international, transnational. So, wh what is the scale that you are looking at? If you are looking at any image that is um, very locally contextual or if you are looking at an image that is, um, you know, of international importance. So, what is the scale of the image that you are looking at, you are studying? The second is the social location. So, social location is that cultural identities of a peop of, of a person or a group of people, um, you know, putting them into embedding them into a, a social order, a social structure. So, the immediate question that you need to ask when you look at an image is that um, what has been the social location of people, you know, who produced that image or if you if you are seeing people in the image, what has been the social location of people that you are looking at in the as part of that image. And that automatically you know brings us to the next point uh, of power geometry or agency. Um, so, power geometry actually is drawn from uh, geographer Dorin Massey's work also which we will uh, take a look at later on in this lecture series. Um, but power geometry talks about that each of us um, are placed in a network of social dynamics, uh, uh, a social structure and how we negotiate our identities, how we negotiate our practices within that geometry would be informed by the power geometry or the agency. And finally, uh, very, very important that GGP provides us with, uh, with a, a, a toolkit um, is the idea of imagination work, that this is the cognitive uh, attribute of people or groups um, that 
influence the production in this case of images, not just production, the consumption, um, the retention of, um, of any image. Um, that we will be dealing with. So, imagination work uh, as a component of GJP gives us, uh, you know, that, that uh, ground to actually talk about how images are imagined. So, this is, uh, this is the first uh, conceptual framework that we will find helpful in our understanding of images and their imaginations uh, in, in the larger context. The second framework that I need to um, put uh, front and center here um, as, as part of this uh, discussion is the idea of boundaries and boundary work. So, boundaries and boundary work uh, like gender geographies of uh, power comes from, um, from studying a particular social order, particular social structure, but again over time it has developed into um, you know an inclusive sort of a boundary, uh, inclusive sort of framework that we use to study other social phenomena. So, if you are familiar with the history of uh, boundaries and boundary work, um, you would see that this is a framework that is primarily arising out of studies on race and ethnicity. That um, um, on, a, on, a, on a hyperlink context, you know, it talks about race as a social uh, construct and um, the boundaries, the social boundaries that we draw to actually emphasize this, to actually, um, you know, establish this um, is something that boundaries and boundary work framework questions and, um, you know, helps us uh, navigate the questions. And then, um, you know, boundary work as a framework is now increasingly used for understanding human behavior in motion, um, which is migration, assimilation, acculturation across uh, the globe. Um, but in this case, uh, in the case of this particular um, uh, uh, series of lectures uh, for images, um, you know, we are going to look at uh, critical questions of what forms of boundary can we see um, when we are trying to study an image. For example, um, uh, when we talk of emphasis um, on boundaries of creating the other, um, you know, in one of the lectures we will talk about the othering of um, cultural identities, um, you know, boundary work would be of great importance um, to talk about that. So, the emphasis on boundaries has been found to be useful because it is their persistence through praxis, through action, that is through the work of setting and maintaining boundaries and even of transgressing. So, boundary work not only you know questions boundaries that have been formed, but boundaries that also have been transgressed and that has ensured the continuation of social divisions. And this is important for us to acknowledge here because if we are adopting a sociological lens to understanding images um, such as this lecture series, um, we also need to be mindful of how social divisions or social stratifications are constructed socially and how they operate. So, Boundary work in a way gives us a skill set, gives us a toolkit um, that helps us to look at how these stratifications are, um, are maintained or they are transgressed um, in given social context. So, um, GJP, gender geographies of power and boundary work would form uh, two of our um, fundamental conceptual frameworks, um, of course, along with sociological imagination by C. W. Mills. So, when we look at boundaries, um, when we look at uh, the nature of boundaries that boundary work um, actually looks at, um, there are at least two different types of boundaries we would be looking at for images. One is symbolic type of um, you know boundaries and one is social boundaries. So, how do we understand what is um, symbolic boundary? Symbolic boundaries are conceptual distinctions made by social actors to categorize objects, people, 
practices and even time and space. So, something that we were talking about uh, in the previous few slides. And social boundaries are objectified in the form of social differences manifested in unequal access to and unequal distribution of resources, material and non-material and social opportunities. So, symbolic boundaries, if you are interested to read more on this, you can go to Lamenton Molnar's um, article on boundary work. But um, the important concept here that they are dealing with is that, um, you know, when we look at an image and we understand that there is a boundary work that is happening in an image. Um, the question that we need to ask is what sort of boundary work are we looking at? What sort of, is it, is, is it a social sort of a category that we are seeing in the form of um, you know, boundary work or is it symbolic? Is it symbol as, is it, is it putting forward something that is symbolic to the individual or the group um, that is looking at, that is consuming the image? Uh, what is the, what is the sort of the nature of boundary that uh, we are looking at? And what, uh, what uh, the Lament and Molnar talks about is that, um, you know, symbolic boundaries uh, you know, they refer to objects, people, practices and even time and space. So, all of these factors, all of these categories uh, would be important for us as we study images. So, with that in mind, um, let me now walk you through uh, some of the very um, conventional uh, attributes of how we understand culture. Um, so, when you, uh, when we go through the next set of uh, lectures, the next lectures, um, you know, and if I'm using any of these terms, you are, uh, you're familiar with what I mean by those. So, um, for, for those of you who are not familiar with the ideas of cultural universals. So, in cultural studies, in anthropological understanding, in sociological uh, parlance, <coughs> Cultural universals um, are cultural features existing in every culture. For example, um, you know, we have symbols across all cultures, right? The nature of symbol, the use of symbols are very different from one culture to the other, but the fact that symbols exist is true for, um, you know, cultures across the globe. So, that is an example of a cultural universal. Family, family, the idea of family as an institution, family as a structure, marriage practices. So, these are um, cultural attributes you would find across the world, but um, what is going to be different is the nature of how they are practiced, the nature of how they are arranged in society is going to be uh, different. Cultural generalities, that is the features common to several, but not all human groups. So, something, some general trends that we can see across the world like extended family or speaking in English. So, cultural generalities are uh, some of the features common to several, but not all human groups. Um, for example, we see the um, case of extended families, we see um, the idea of speaking in English um, across the globe. Uh, it, it, they may not be cultural universals, that is they are not, uh, you know, found everywhere across the globe, but uh, they are general patterns that we see across uh, cultural settings. And cultural particularities are features unique to certain cultural traditions. Um, for example, um, any belief system or religious um, practices that we see that are particular of any cultural um, setting. So, the reason of walking you through these ideas is that when you look at an image, um, possibly uh, one of the first questions you can ask is the image you are looking at, is it a cultural universal? Is it an image that you would be finding across the globe? If not, is it a cultural, um, you know, general generality? That is, is it is it a general pattern of the image that you would, um, you know, find across the globe, or is it a cultural particularity? That you know, is it very very local uh, to the context you are looking at? The two other critical angles that you need to, uh, 
keep in mind uh, when you look at uh, images and we will explore this in uh, more details in the next uh, lectures. The first is ethnocentrism. That is the tendency to view one's own culture as superior and to apply one's own cultural values in judging the behavior and beliefs of people raised in other cultures. So, ethnocentrism is actually um, putting the viewer in a context where the viewer is, um, you know, looking at the image from his or her perspective. And cultural relativism is the behavior in one culture that should not be and cultural relativism is the behavior in one's culture uh, that should not be judged by standards of another culture. So, ethnocentrism and cultural relativism are two concepts that we need to keep in mind um, when we are looking at uh, images particularly that would demand questions of uh, you know contextualizing them in their social uh, settings. Um, and finally, um, uh, going back to the question of scale, um, you know, and, and levels of culture, um, if we are dealing with images uh, that relate to questions of national culture, for example, beliefs, uh, behavior patterns, values, institutions shared by citizens of the same nation, or we are dealing with images that speaks to uh, questions of international culture that is um, extending beyond and across national boundaries. Um, so, many of the questions, many cultural traits and patterns um, acquired international scope due to diffusion or borrowing, um, migration, colonialism and globalization. So, if we are looking at uh, many of these images, that, uh, that have gone um, to an international scale because of these dynamics, um, we need to situate them um, um, in their own context. <coughs> um, and also, if we are dealing with images and questions of culture, we also need to be aware of the rights of the individual. That is, um, you know, questions of human rights, questions of cultural rights, um, questions of uh, IPR, intellectual property rights, um, so conservation of each society's core beliefs, knowledge and practices. So now, um, I am coming towards the end of uh, this lecture and I want to leave you with um, some of the developing scopes and dimensions of research on images, imaginations and culture. So, if you look at the International Sociological Association, um, World Congress of Sociology's visual sociology sessions um, that are being proposed for the upcoming um, uh, 2022 World Sociology, uh, World Congress of Sociology. Um, what you will see is that the nature of panels that have been proposed and speaking to questions of visual culture, speaking to questions of images, imaginations and their culture are distinct and varied and thus defining the broadening scope of um, you know the topic of this lecture series. For example, we see panels on cross disciplinary perspectives of visual research, we see um, panels being proposed on visual data and ethics, um, we see the questions of space, the spatial turn in visual sociology. We see questions of digital humanities and visual culture very, very important. And we also see the algorithmic turn in visual studies. So, we see interdisciplinary natures um, that are coming in questions of um, understanding images, imaginations and their culture. So, um, to wrap up. Um, and this is, um, I'm going to end with three very powerful images for you. Um, the first image that you are seeing on my screen um, is the first prize winner of the Rachel Tanor Memorial Prize in Visual Sociology um, in 2022. And what you see in the image and the little write up by um, the provider of the photograph is given um, below the uh, image that it is um, speaking to questions of identity of place and it is also looking at 
methods of inquiry engaging with place um, through this lens based um, image. So, how you look at an image, you know, the questions that you ask when you look at the image um, are as important as, um, you know, the viewer of the image. So, this is, this is the first prize winner of um, that uh, visual sociology competition and I think um, this is a very powerful image for us to start with, uh, with various questions of, of space, of place, of the visual, of methods um, that we will cover um, in, in the lecture series. The second prize winner of the same uh, competition is, um, is, is this image that you see. Um, and you also see, um, you know, a description of the image um, right below uh, the name of the person who has taken the image. So, what is important for us uh, for this uh, type of, uh, you know, image is to remember uh, questions of mobility, questions of mobility and also, um, you know, how we as a group, uh, you know, refer to questions of mobility. And the third prize uh, winner of the same competition um, is this image that you see on the screen. Um, and this is taken um, uh, again in a Brazilian societal setting. Um, and this is a, an image of sugar plantation. And um, if you read the description uh, that's below the image and the image uh, uh, the photographer, um, is that the description talks about not just what you see on in the image, but also what you do not see. And that is something that, you know, we need to keep in mind that whenever we are, we are, you know, seeing an image, you know, an image is a frame. So that frame, what we are seeing in that image is something that we are also not seeing in that frame. So what you see versus what you not see becomes equally important. So, with this, I do want to end um, with concluding thoughts and with a question to you, my viewers, is that why do we need to understand culture to understand images and their imaginations? So, this is a question I would like you to ponder. This is a question I would like you to do a little more research on and, um, you know, to, to come up with an understanding of why, you know, so what? Why do we need to understand culture and social processes to understand, you know, any image that we are going to study and how they have been imagined? So, on this note, I would like to conclude uh, the first lecture and, uh, you know, in the next lecture we will talk about um, the history of visual culture. Thank you. Hello, I am A.K. Sharma and I teach sociology in IIT Kanpur. I am attempting to answer a simple question, uh, what is sociology? Now friends, uh, one simple answer would be that sociology is a study of human behavior. And this study of human behavior has a history. Actually, uh, due to growth of science, technology and due to industrialization and economic development in the West, initially there was a hope that by application of science and technology, the face of this world can be changed to the advantage of mankind. But what was found or what was observed that this did not happen. And despite economic development, urbanization, industrialization, surveys showed that poverty had increased, unemployment had in increased, even health conditions became worse. And 
Today you will be surprised to know that there was a time when death rate of urban areas was higher than the death rate of rural areas. Cities or the places of development, industrialization and education and enlightenment became consumers of rural population. So, people started asking why is it so? And some philosophers, engineers, mathematicians who contributed to emergence of a discipline like sociology started thinking that perhaps we need a new subject in which we will apply the same tools and techniques which are being used by scientists, mathematicians, physicists, chemists, but we will study human behavior. In other words, we will try to discover if there are laws of human behavior and by applying those laws perhaps in the future, the condition of mankind can be improved. This is how sociology developed. Initially, uh, uh, August Com called the social physics. He, he also used terms like social statics and social dynamics, the usual division of mathematics and he believed that social statics will study relationship between different parts of society and social dynamics will study relationship between parts of society and total society, change in total society. Now, you, uh, you may uh, ask that if sociology is the study of human behavior, there are many other branches of social sciences which study human behavior, economics, anthropology, psychology, etc., etc. They, that, uh, difference between sociology and these disciplines is that while in these disciplines we study one specific aspect of human behavior, like economics will study production and distribution of wealth, psychology will study cognitive processes or mental models or personality, social psychology will study personality, anthropology will study culture. Now, somebody has to relate uh, one aspect of human behavior with the other aspects or one social fact with the other. These are all social facts for us. And if somebody tries to link cognitive processes with economic conditions or urbanization or caste system or religion or somebody tries to relate uh, urbanization with uh, human psyche or somebody tries to uh, correlate uh, cultural context with economic behavior, then it becomes sociology. So, sociology combines uh, different areas which are individually studied by different disciplines. And uh, sociology also studies new questions which are not studied by any existing subject so far. So, like uh, these days uh, issues of uh, waste disposal, entropy, environment, safety, uh, urban places as uh, new geomorphological systems come up and we want to correlate one aspect of urbanization say percentage of population living in urban areas and risk environmental risk, carbon dioxide, this emission, that emission. Now, which will be the first discipline to take interest in these things? Because uh, sociology. So, sociology not only combines uh, facts from different aspects of society, sociology also addresses new questions. And uh, I can also say that one central feature of sociology is to explain individual behavior or individual psyche in terms of properties of larger society. In simple terms, if you imagine uh, that there are two aspects of human behavior, individual and society, then while uh, other disciplines are, other disciplines like psychology are focusing more on individual, we study characteristics of individuals in terms of certain characteristics of larger society. This is what sociology does. Sociology is very useful for planners. Sociology 
is useful for answering new questions as I said, which have not been answered by any existing discipline. And I would say that sociology is especially helpful uh, for self enlightenment or for developing empathy, because sociology only tells you that there are no right or wrong answers of uh, social issues. Uh, it is not physics, it is not mathematics, it does not have fixed answers to issues, because questions can be looked at from variety of perspectives. So, role of perspectives, thinking, interest, power, etcetera, etcetera also come up uh, in, in answering social questions. And it is this aspect that something can be looked at from variety of perspective, that something can be looked at from the perspective of government, the same thing can be looked at entirely differently from the perspective of people or from the perspective of NGOs or from the perspective of experts. So, this realization, this takes us to self enlightenment and empathy. Thank you.